I, I know you don't want to hear this. I know you don't want to hear it, but look at me. Listen to me. Uh, the, you are, have become, without asking to be, responsible for the Crosby Barrett community. It's, it's been on your shoulders, Pastor Ron, for years. You've mantled that. When others like me, you know, slipped and fell and had to start all over again, you, you stayed up, sir. You kept after it. And, uh, you know, and I, I, want to, I want this church to know you're a man worthy of honor, and I have no problem calling you Bishop Ron Eagleton. I'm so glad y'all were active tonight. Y'all would embarrass me if y'all had stayed too white quiet. I'm telling you, Brother David, that bothers me. Because when I go to his church, you ain't sitting down. No, 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 no. They, it's, it's happening and hopping. So y'all blessed me tonight. Y'all did as good as white folk can. I appreciate that. I do appreciate that. All my heart. Amen. Uh, the, 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 does he know y'all here yet? Did he, does he know? The whiteheads are here. Do you know that? They ain't from your church. Sister Lord, would you do that and bring them some? The Whiteheads from Fort Worth, Texas came down here. Man, they must really love you. Appreciate you guys coming down. Now that y'all know who's in the room, reach over, shake hands, greet each other. Welcome to the Little Country Church.
be seated for a brief moment. Again, those watching by HolyWild.tv, thanks for tuning in. We started a little early on you just tonight, if you're just tuning in. And uh, I, I, I sometimes, uh, I'm going to do this right now. Normally, I would wait to the end of the service. Um, I'm, a, I'm not just a, a tither. I'm also a very good tipper. If you've ever been at a restaurant with me, know this, that if you serve well, I tip well. I've got waitresses that have come to our church because of the way I tipped them and have brought their family. Honest to God. I was a woman in here Sunday whose daughter I tipped well at a, at a roadhouse, and now her mama's in our church. Uh, I believe in taking care of people. I just do. I'm just going to take care of you. I'm going to do the best I can. I take care of our staff because I can I take care of people around me. So normally I would wait to the end of a service like this before I would take an offering up. And, uh, and, but I want to do that now because I think you know what's coming. Now let me tell you something. Why do you give before you eat? Because you know what you're going to get. Two all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun, which used to be $3.50 and now 8 bucks. All right. You don't, you don't tip for two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun, do you? You don't tip. None of y'all tip at McDonald's. You know what you're getting, and you get it, and you go. But then you go to steak. Uh, there you go. Give me a little background. But then you go to salt grass, or you go over to Outback, and, you know, and, and then that steak comes out, and it's just the way you want it. And then when it's over, not only are you paying an exorbitant price for 12 ounces of ribeye and a potato and an awesome blossom. <laughs> but now, now, now because that waitress kept that tea glass full and smiled when she came by, you're going you're gonna to tip. Sometimes you'll tip the price of whatever that meal was because you just appreciate that. And when you're gone, you're gone. You're not going to walk back in and give nothing. So you're here right now. When you're gone, you're gone. So this is a, I'll never get a Tuesday night crowd like this again. Amen. <laughs> I'll get you. Because we'll have a different one next Tuesday. You know what I'm saying? So what I'm saying to you right now is I want you to believe that filet mignon is fixing to come in here. <laughs> awesome blossom is on its way. Matter of fact, we done had some good church already. So I, 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 I want to bless these men of God that are here. You... Listen, David Huff at 95 years old. We don't know how long we're going to get him. You know, he, he says things, and it sounds like a little a slip when he said, I've been with y'all 20 years. So you know we celebrating 15 years. But what you may not know is five years before he ever got here, he was with us at Crosby Church with me. This man's always been with me. He stayed with me all the way through. He, he never backed away. He loves you. So I, I, he's in Atlanta, and this is what he does for He's not retired. He didn't take retirement. He's like me. He's going to have to do this. It ain't in the Bible, retirement. If you can be retired, that's fine. God bless you. But some of us, we're going we're gonna to live full and die empty. Amen. So, uh, Brother David, we're going to make sure we get you enough to get you back on that airplane. Bishop drove down here. He drove down here. He didn't ask for a plane ticket. He drove down here. And he's in a Chevy, so we're going to have to help him. <laughs> so if I get our servant leaders to come up right now, we're going to shift this. Now, look, don't let me down tonight. Don't slap a dollar inside that if you've got a 20 stuck back or a 100 stuck back. I want everybody to be a giver. Some of you, you know you can give a 1,000. Give a 1,000. Amen. But let's bless these guys tonight. because I, uh, let, You know this, uh, Bishop Gary. I've been, uh, Miles Monroe died a few years ago in a plane crash. You knew Miles, didn't you, Bishop? Amen. And uh, loved him. But I'd be at a conference with him, and literally this was that, because he would fly a private plane in from the Bahamas. This man was extremely uh, hard to get in a church. His books are still filled up the bookstores. Died in a plane crash a couple years ago. I bought him his first pair of cowboy boots. But he's a millionaire, and I bought him a pair of cowboy boots. You said he could have bought his own. I know he could have. But I want to sow where I'm going. So if I want that kind of anointing, that kind, I want to make sure that man knows. And ever since, he called me cowboy preacher every time he saw me. I love Miles Monroe. You have to YouTube him. I'm telling you, he will, he will blow you away with his teaching and thinking. Now listen, 
I'd go to conferences and I'd hear him, and I'd hear, I have to hear the preacher say, now we got to get more money to be able to take care of him. And when I say entourage, he had book sales and all kind of things. It took a lot of money for some of these guys. Well, we have the quality of not maybe, you know, I'm not trying to compare, comparison to more lines. But I'm going to tell you, I spent some time with, with, with Bishop Gary, and I did not realize the impact he's made on the body of Christ and the places he's been and the people he's connected with. He worth sowing into tonight. You already know about Brother David Huff. He worth sowing into. So we almost have to double up because we brought these two men in. So tonight, give a very generous offer. Lift your hand. Our servant leaders are making their way to you. Please give me an envelope. Ronnie. Amen. Guys, you know the announcements. This, uh, tomorrow night will be our last night of our conference. Then as we move through it, are you doing a, a, a movie thing? Would you tell them about it? Well, I don't see out of my paper. Ladies, we have a movie night that we're going to be doing this Friday night um, in the Kingwood Movie Theater. Um, try to be there about 6.30. The movie starts at 7, but we want to make sure we get seats together. So hope y'all can make it out. Showbiz, 6.30. It is. Kingwood. Kingwood. That's going to work good. Now, next Wednesday night, we will not have church in New Caney. We'll have church here on Tuesday night here. So those of you from New Caney, you in church, come here. Because then on Wednesday night, which will be Halloween, All Hallows Night, All Hallelujah Night, we're going to have a, a, a trunk or treat out at the ranch. Now, I don't know much about trunk or treats, all right? I've never done one. I just heard you throw a bunch of candy in the trunk, and kids come by and get it, and we want to create a safe place. But so what I decided to do, we're going to amp it up a little bit. You know, the Lord has blessed us with 110 acres out there in New Caney in, in the most wooded area filled with coyotes and wild boar hogs and <laughs> possums and skunks and everything imaginable out there in the world. So we, we're going to take a haunted trail, and we're going to go. And I've done this before. And I'll tell you, Tommy, this is fun. But there's a rumor that in them woods, <laughs> I might have to take Jason out. Y'all know about Jason. They ain't killed him yet. Michael Myers is in them woods. I'm going to take him out. I'm going to take him out. But the worst of all of them is Beelzebub. Lord of the woods, I got to take him out. So we're going to go take that wagon train through there. And you got to be careful because you don't know about all the witches that are out there in the woods. So we're going to have a little haunted trail thing. So we're going we're to have a blessing for the kids. <laughs> I remember this a few years ago now. I'm going to tell you. I, they never forgot it. Sam, did you take that ride? Do you, do, you know, do you remember who Beelzebub was? Don Nash. Yeah. Yeah, I, I shot him every time I came through. I had blanks in my 45. I shot him dead every time. He had to hit the ground. He said he's so tired of hitting the ground because every time I come through there, he knew he had to get up again. Amen. So, I, Sam, I got to find me a Beelzebub. I'm just saying, you know, if the Lord talks to you. <laughs> and, guys, listen, that's on the 31st. And then that morning we're going to get up and we're going to ride to Hot Springs, Arkansas, on our motorcycles and our three-wheelers and your cars and your trucks, and we're going to run through Highway 7. Bishop said he might even come over and meet with us. Jake Jones said uh, from Tulsa, Oklahoma, said he's going to try to come over and meet with us after back surgery, you know. So I'm, I'm just looking forward to running the, running the curves up there. Ain't nothing sweeter than them curves up in Arkansas, Highway 7. Woo! Love it, love it, Jesus. That's a carrot out in front of me. Amen? So... You know, guys, we say this. Sister Lord, let's put up our, our commission, what we say, because I believe if you say it and believe it enough, God will do it for you. Amen? So tonight we're sowing into these ministries, so as we give, we're believing God for? More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns. And success to the kingdom. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. Of deliverance from my enemies. 
till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. Amen. Would you put your hands together and welcome the legend, David Huff. David is actually 74 years old, so... Please forgive my discretions. Uh, Y'all may be seated a minute. Hallelujah. I told y'all this the last time. Uh, when I'm here, all I want to do is smile. Y'all make me smile. I feel like I'm in a heavenly place. Uh, I love diversity because I feel heaven is filled with diversity. Hallelujah. Can I get a witness, y'all? I was born in the Mississippi in a little three-room shack. We didn't have a whole lot. Didn't have this electricity, no running water. We were just poor folks, but we didn't know we was poor folks. Hallelujah. We went to town every Saturday, and my daddy would get 100 pounds of ice, bring it back, wrap it up, and put it in the chimney. We could have iced tea, because we didn't have a refrigerator. And so my daddy, every time we get ready to go to town, he'd do. Because we didn't have a radio. No stereo. But finally, when I was about in the ninth grade, the lights came on. And my dad went out and got a radio. And I'd pick up WSM Grand Ole Opry. Hallelujah. Friday nights, Saturday nights. And so, one day, I was scanning the dial. And it wasn't WSM Grand Ole Opry that I heard. Because I heard something that went like... Hey, mama, don't you treat me wrong. I said, whoa, that don't sound like Johnny Cash. So that started me on a journey. And uh, that journey took me to Muscle Shows, Sweet Home Alabama. It took me to California with MGM. And then I found myself in a little church house, Laurel, Mississippi, similar to this church. And there I was born into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And so I've had a special request to do this next song. And so I dedicate this song to my dad because every time I do it, I always feel like he's looking down from heaven like, I told you. Because he always wanted me to do that kind of music. He never liked that. That was my daddy. So, there's a little lady here that requested Fanatic. Are you here tonight? Okay, good. Because I was thinking, I hadn't done this song in so long. I pray she's there tonight. Cause, but uh, but I, I know that one time Paul said, we're fools for Christ. 
In other words, we're going to be fools for something. Why not be a fool for Christ? Can I get a witness here tonight? Hallelujah. Here we go. I hear people talking, saying I've gone off from the deep end. Saying I've got religion, telling that I've been a born again. Well, listen to me, people. What you say is true. I've become a fool for Christ, and I agree with you. I'm a fanatic. Oh, I'm crazy about my Lord. I'm a fanatic. Call me anything you want. Well, I love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul tonight. When it comes to Jesus, I'm a fanatic. Woo! Well, I used to go to those ball games. Everybody shouting and clapping of their hands. Then I got to thinking, how much more should we praise the Son of Man? No one else but Jesus has ever died for me. And that's enough for me to shout and praise His holy name. I'm a fanatic. Oh, I'm crazy about my Lord. I'm a fanatic. Call me in the thing you want. Well, I love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul and man. When it comes to Jesus, I'm a fanatic. I'm gonna do a little picking and a grinning. the right place at the right time. Okay. Go ahead, please. More track. No better place to be 
forget the first time David, Rayburn, and Claiborne, Huff came to my church when I was a kid, and I got mad because they wouldn't let me play rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good, man. It was good. How many of y'all appreciate Brother David? Come on, come on. Give it up for him. may be seated just for a minute because I don't know what I'm doing. Just no blues turnaround kind of thing. All right. There is no telling what God will do if you believe. There is no telling what God will do I know He healed my body And saved my soul There is no telling What God will do If you believe Anybody feel that way tonight? Try 
he did and saved my soul. There is no telling what God will do. God, now I'm out of breath. How many of y'all have been enjoying the conference thus far? Man, you know, I just think it is so uh, vitally important uh, that we once again appreciate the guest ministers who have come to be with us tonight, and we honor them tonight, and uh Thank you for being here, and I think it's very important for this house that you honor the man that God has given you as the angel of this house. Come on and let Pastor Jerry know how much you really appreciate him. I get just a little more mic down here. Come on, thank the Lord for him. Thank the Lord for him. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. You reminded me what I forgot. Lord bless the children. <laughs> See, y'all making all fun of me and stuff and make like I'm all that. I still forget stuff. I've been doing this for 25 years. I still forget. Love these kids. Love our teachers. Appreciate you guys so much. Hey, Amen. Go have a great class. Man, that was... But David, that was like, where'd he go? Man, amazing, amazing. Y'all welcome. I mean, we hadn't got a chance to do this, but I'm going to tell you, I got to ride around with these guys the last few days and hang out. And, you know, and again, to hear them talk music and hear them talk people they know, and no matter how, you know, the church, the church ain't got it all together, but it's the only thing floating. Amen. I'd rather live with the stink and perish in the storm. Amen. I'd rather be in this mess and all the mess out there. So glad to be here, and I, and I love this man behind me. I have deep respect for him, and, and thank God for him. And he think he thinks like, or maybe I should say, since he's so much older than I am, uh, I think I think a lot like him. So that that blessed me. Y'all give Bishop Gary Oliver another hand. Thank you. Brother. Oh, bless the Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. I am indeed honored to have Jerry and Susie Whitehead here tonight. 
Um, they are some of the most loyal, faithful saints of Tabernacle of Praise. Uh, these you need you need something prayed through. Just go get Susie Whitehead. She'll crawl all over that floor with you and pray until God breaks it open. Brother Jerry, I'll tell you what, these these people right here are salt of the earth and, and giving and loving and just amazing people. So I'm honored to be their pastor, and I love you guys very much. Um, open your Bibles tonight if you've got your Bibles or your phone or whatever it is you're looking at. And uh, if you're looking at your phone, make sure it's open to the Bible. <clears throat> Don't be YouTubing and scrolling and stuff like that. Anyway, I want you to go with me to Exodus 6. I just uh, want to drop something on you tonight. I know it's midweek, and I know that we're not going to try to stay here all night, but I want to put something in your spirit uh, because of some things that I heard Pastor Jerry talking about, and of course, uh, where we've been on Sunday <clears throat> and uh, what the Lord has been speaking to us already. I think that everything just kind of builds upon itself uh, when you're having a moment with God, that God layers things and builds things. And one of the things that I really um, have been impressed with so much lately is that uh, in our churches and uh, in our, our services, we always have a moment for people to come to the altar and uh, for salvation. And uh, the struggle is, is that we see people come and they accept the Lord, um, as we say, pray a sinner's prayer, as we say, but not very much changes in their life. And it's, as a pastor, it's frustrating to see people still come to church five years later and still struggling with the same thing that they were struggling with when they first came. And when you have a moment for prayer, you pray for people and you pray for people over and over and over for the same thing. And it's not, it's not the people's fault. Here's what I want you to understand. It's not the people's fault. I think it's the fault of the pulpits because we don't teach the fuller gospel of God. Hang with me. I think that God has something for us that is deeper than just a salvation experience. There is more to God than, and, and repentance, honestly, is not saying I'm sorry. That is, that is not real repentance. Let, let me give you a real definition of repentance. Repentance means to turn from something and to, watch this, think differently afterwards. And if you don't leave that, if you leave that part out of it, there's not a real, in fact, let me, let me, let me give you another definition. Let me give you another little descriptive here of repentance. Here's another descriptive of repentance. You know, in the Hebrew language, Hebrew is written almost like pic, uh, pictorial. It's a, a pictograph kind of thing. And so if you look at the word repent in Hebrew, in the original language, which the uh, Jewish people would call God's language because they said he spoke to them in that language. What it was is he spoke to them in the tongue they understood. Because... <laughs> Are y'all with me? So I don't know if it's God's language because he speaks to me in English. Are y'all with me? So here's, here's the thing. And, and, the, and the cool thing about God is he doesn't speak to me in King James English. He doesn't say he that waiteth upon me. You know, it's, he doesn't talk to me like that. God talks to me like I am. He meets you where you are. So in the, in the original language of the Bible, the Hebrew language, the picture, the word picture for repentance, just watch this because this will bless you, is like a little triangle with an extension on the front of it. In other words, it represents a house with a porch kind of thing. It's like a, a, a dwelling place, okay? The next letter that you will see literally looks like a flame. 
So to repent means, watch this, to burn your house. What's this? Repentance, real repentance means I have nothing to go back to. Come on, y'all. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Isn't that a beautiful uh, picture, though? And so what, what real repentance is, is real repentance is cutting away of all of the old stuff, the old habits. It's taking away uh, all of the, the old things. And sometimes we repent for things that we don't quite get over. The first go. <laughs> Am I talking to anybody? Can we be real today? So I want to give you the four I wheels of God that will, I believe, bless your life and help you understand where God is trying to take the body of Christ. Go with me to Exodus 6, verse 6. And this is what God says. He says, say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God. Now, those are the four I wills. And I'm going to read the rest of this. He said, and you shall know that I'm the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you for a possession, for I am the Lord. Now, how many of you know that the promised land had some giants in it? So there were some battles that were ahead. So let me just tell you, the promised land is not heaven. The promised land is the church. But when I get here, I'm going to have some giants to fight. I may have some enemies to deal with once I get into my promised land. Come on, y'all. Are y'all with me? So watch this. The first promise that God gives us is he says, I'm going to bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Everybody say that with me. Say, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Now, you will remember the story. And if you remember the depth of the story, even Abraham, when he was promised that he was going to have offspring, he was told that his lineage, that his offspring would be taken into bondage for 400 years. He was told that, that they would be taken into slavery for 400 years. And you remember, Joseph is taken prisoner. Let me just give you a little, a little piece, a little glimpse into God, a little glimpse into God. Let me give you a little glimpse into God because this gives you some help and some hope. Watch this. When Joseph is taken hostage, do you remember who takes him hostage? Joseph is Isaac's boy. Are y'all with me? And, or Jacob's boy. Joseph is Jacob's boy. He's Isaac's grandson. Jacob's son. And so he is taken hostage by his brothers who are the 12 tribes of Israel and they put him in a pit and they put blood on his coat. Are y'all with me? And guess who they gave him to? They gave him to Ishmaelites. So the very thing that everybody claims was Abraham's busy, biggest mistake, Ishmael, is the very one that got Joseph to the promised land or to Potiphar's house to save them. Don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. Sometimes the things you use as or you view as your biggest mistake, what the enemy meant for evil, y'all, God will turn for your good. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So Ishmaelites were the ones that took Joseph and they take him into Pharaoh's house. Joseph is taken prisoner into the house of Pharaoh and his family becomes slaves to Egypt. After the first Pharaoh dies, the Bible says that there was another Pharaoh 
that arose that Joseph didn't know or didn't know Joseph. He didn't know who he was. Had no, so the people of Isaac and Jacob and Joseph are all becoming enslaved now. So in typology, hear this, Egypt becomes a type of sin. Am I right about it? So Egypt is a type of sin. It, it, are y'all with me? Okay, because some of y'all are looking at me like, what, what's, what's typology. The Old Testament is full of pictures for us. And so Egypt is this picture of sin. Because you've got to understand this. Sin enslaves you. Come on with me. Sin puts you in a yoke of bondage. Sin takes away your hope. And, and really, it is harder to live a life of sin than it is a life of holiness. <laughs> Some of y'all looking at me real funny on that one. Because if I'm living holy, I don't have to remember what I did last night. If I'm living holy, I don't have to remember what I told what, who I told what, whose number I got in my phone. Oh, y'all. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? So God says, he says this, he says, I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. This is a picture, a beautiful picture of salvation. Are you with me? So God is saying today that through my son's life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and your belief in him is true salvation, the burden of sin can be removed off your life today. How many of you glad for salvation in here tonight? You glad that repentance is a part of your life. Repentance, not just turning around and thinking differently afterwards. So God says, here's what I want to do. I want to deliver you from the place of sin. Number two, watch this with me. God says, not only will I bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, but I will deliver you from their bondage. Now, you listen, just, just think about this for a minute, because you would think that if God is delivering me out from under the burden of the Egyptians, then I would be free of their bondage. But that's not necessarily true, because what God is saying is, not only am I going to get you out of Egypt, but when I get you out of Egypt, I'm going to get Egypt out of you. Are y'all with me? Are you with me? You would think, you would think that, that, that it's all one process. But can I tell you today that there is a journey toward freedom that we have to walk out as a believer. It's not just getting saved. And so many people get confused because they think once I get saved, then everything in my life is going to be all right. And then they wake up on Tuesday morning after getting saved on Sunday and they still had a flat tire anyway. And they were still late going to work and the kids still got in trouble at school and everything was still going on in their life. And they're like, oh my God, I thought all of this was going to turn around for me. But there is a process to the journey and there is a journey to the process and and the journey is never about the destination. The journey is always about me being right for where God is about to take me. Are you with me? Freedom, freedom. Somebody say freedom. freedom. You got to understand that freedom, and I'm not going to be real long tonight, so just hang with me. Freedom, freedom is not something that we necessarily get sitting in a church pew. Remember last night when I was talking about community, talking about or Sunday night, talking about community, and we were talking about how community works in our life, and you cannot forsake community for the house of God, but you cannot forsake the house of God for community. They both work in tandem. I need strong men around me. I need godly praying folks around me like the whiteheads. I need folks to pick me up when I'm down. I need folks to encourage me. And freedom, real freedom, is not just going to an altar and repenting, but real freedom is worked out in my day-to-day -day life. As I get around people that I trust and brothers that I build covenant relationship with. I had a little ball cap on earlier Pastor said, what's that CB on your head? And it's covenant of brotherhood. 
because our men's group is called Covenant of Brotherhood. It talks about it in the scripture where the Bible says that God was upset with them because they had forsaken the covenant of brotherhood. There is something about being connected with people that you can talk with and people that you can relate to. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to stand up in front of the church and hang out my underwear. Are y'all hearing what I'm telling you? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. No dirty laundry up in here. But if I'm dealing one-on-one -on -one with another brother, I can say, hey, man, I really need you to pray for me. That's why pastors need pastors. That's why, oh, God. That's why pastors need men of God around them, that they can go sit down and say, hey, I tripped, I messed up, I failed, I made a mistake, I did the wrong thing, or just I sinned. Because you, you can sit here and act like we don't sin. But all of us do sin and we do mess up. And when we do mess up, the Bible says that we are to give the enemy no foothold in our life. And the foothold, y'all watch this. Just stay with me two minutes. The foothold, the foothold that we give the enemy, watch this. The Bible talks about when the demons fell from heaven that they were chained in darkness. And chained to darkness. They're chained in darkness. They're chained to darkness. Watch this. Any place in your life that you will not allow the light of God to shine on, you can be demonized. I don't believe that Christians can be demon possessed. That's not what I'm saying. Because I can, because to be demon possessed, you got to define the word, y'all. You got to define the word. To be demon possessed means that I'm out of control. Something else is controlling me. Well, if I've got the Holy Spirit in me, ain't no demon controlling me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But even though I have the Holy Spirit in me, I can still struggle with depression. Come on, y'all. I can still struggle with. With uh, carnal sin, I can still struggle with lust. I can still, y'all not going to help me here, but I can still struggle with lust. I can still struggle with pornography. Don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. I can still struggle with issues that I'm not willing to allow the light of God to shine on. And the reason we're not afraid, we're so afraid of letting the light of God shine on us is because we don't trust nobody. Y'all got to get real with me in here. You got to get real with me in here. But we've got to get beyond the place of distrusting everybody. And I got to be able to find a Jerry Hovater in my life that I can go to and say, Hey, Pastor Jerry, I need you to help me. This is Bishop Gary. I need you to pray for me today. I'm struggling with an issue. And I'm struggling with something going on in my life. I may not have to tell him all the details, but I want the light of God to shine on it so I can have accountability so I'm not demonized and I'm walking in freedom. <laughs> it's not the sin you admit that hurts you. It's the sin you never talk about. It's the secret sin. That's a Selah moment. That's kind of heavy, isn't it? That's like, wow. You know, you don't cuss around the saints too much, but when you talk to your wife, shut up now. Don't, don't, don't shout me down. <laughs> when you get around your wife, you go to cussing her out. And Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Because I got anger issues. But I don't show those anger issues around other men but I show it when I'm home. I know this is, this is not fun stuff. It's not fun. It's not fun. But see, this is how, this is how we're going to get free, folks. This is how we're going to get beyond this place that keeps hanging us up. It's the stuff we won't let go of. As long as I'm holding on to this thing, I can't move. Are you hearing me? So there has to be something. We have to find freedom. God is saying, listen, I don't want to just get you saved. I don't want to just get you out of Egypt. I want to get Egypt out of you. 
Are you hearing me tonight? Now watch this. I know it's, it's 8.30. I'm keeping up with the time, y'all. Number three. This is powerful. Did that, did that connect for y'all? Can't you feel that in here, though? You feel that conviction of that? See, when I feel conviction of things like that, I'm going to tell you, I start asking God, God, what is it in my life that I need to get straight? What is it in my life that I need to confess? What is it in my life that I need to straighten out? And listen, can I just, I'm, I'm just being honest with you. You don't have to tell all your details. I told you that Sunday night. Don't tell your details. You ain't got to tell all your details. There's, there's certain things that you can't say to some people. Not everybody is ready for your faults. And you got to know who you're around. You got to know who's in your life. And you got to know people that are, that are weak and people that are strong. You don't go sit down with people that are weak, already struggling, and tell them your issue. Unless you delivered. And you say, you know what, I understand because I walked through that too. And see, that's the whole power of getting your deliverance. Because when you get your deliverance, God never delivers you just for you. Come on, y'all. He never delivers you just for you. Remember when he was given the children of Israel their promised land? He told uh, the two and a half tribes, he said, y'all get over here and y'all take your land on this side of the river and y'all get ready because on the other side of the river, you're going to have to go help your brothers get their land. Right. See, there's some folks that's going to get delivered right away. There's some people going to get healed right away. But why did you get healed right away? So you could help other folks. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Go get their land. Are you with me tonight? So number three, God says, after I get you delivered and in the process of the journey, he says, I'm going to redeem you. 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 You think sometimes we think that redeem, and I'm, <sighs> definitions are important, y'all. Definitions are vitally important. How you look at a word, how you understand a word. We throw words around so much today that we use, and we use them. Are y'all okay? Because y'all kind of quiet just looking at me like, whoo, boy, that was a little whipping right there. But I don't mean that as a whipping. I mean that as healthy and helping you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? want you to be healthy. I want, I want to see this church explode in this city. I want to see God send a revival to Crosby. I want to see God do something in this town with this pastor and with that brother over there preaching in the, the motorcycle rallies. I want to see God do something in East Texas, South Texas, whatever y'all call this part down here. But <laughs> See, I don't want to be East Texas. Huh? You want to be South Texas or you don't want to be South. You want to be East. I don't know. It's confusing to me. Southeast. Houston, how about that? Okay. <laughs> but in this part of the country, I want to see God do a revival. Why? Because whatever happens here is going to spread to where I am too. It's going to come. It's going to ignite something in me. Are you with me? So when God says that I'm going to, I'm going to redeem you, he says, not only am I going to get you saved, but then, and I'm going to get you out of Egypt, then I'm going to start getting Egypt out of you. Now that's a process, y'all. That's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. And I know a lot of us, boy, we don't like that part of the journey. But that's a process. And that's part of it. It's part of the deal. And we have to walk through it. We have to be able to express ourselves to one another. We have to be able to find those groups that are caring and loving and helping. And I don't know of a church that has more community than this church. I don't, I don't know of a church that has more community than this church. And that community ought to make this the most healthy church on the face of the earth. Because you've got people around you you know. You've been with them for a long time. You've, done, you've stayed here and, and been with, with certain folks in your life that some of you have been together for 15 years. Some of you have been together for 20 or 30 years. You've known each other. This ought to make this a healthy house. Come on, are y'all with me? So he says, I'm going to get you out of Egypt. I'm going to get Egypt out of you, and I'm going to redeem you. Now, the word redeem literally means to buy back, to buy back. Um, th there's a scripture in Ephesians that's always kind of messed with me where he says, redeem the time for the days are evil. And, and I, I asked God one time, I said, how in the world do I buy back something that I never owned? 
because I don't own time. Time keeps going. Even when I ask it to stop, it just keeps right on going. <laughs> Even when I ask it to slow down, it just keeps right on going <laughs> at the same pace. Even when I say, God, I need one more hour in the day, it still clicks over to the next day right on. And I said, God, how do I redeem time? And watch this. He said, you redeem time when you tell time how you will spend it. Not by letting time tell you how you're going to be spent. That's powerful right there, y'all. When you stop and say, wait a minute, I need to get up in the morning just a little early. I love those shirts y'all got on. I love my church. Those are cool. I love those. When you get up in the morning, it's like I need a certain amount of time that I've got to spend with God. And I'm going to spend that time because I'm going to redeem that time. I'm going to tell that time how I'm going to spend it. That time is not going to tell me how I'm going to be spent. So watch this. He says, I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to buy you back. But when I buy something back, when I go get something, if, if I love my horses and if I had somebody to come into my barn and take my saddles, and I went back and had to go get my saddles back and redeem my saddles. When I get those saddles back, I don't bring them in the house and put them on a shelf and say, hey, I got them back. Look, I redeemed them. No, I take them and I return them to their original intent. I use them for my original purpose. So when, for God to redeem you doesn't just mean that I bought you back and I'm going to put you on the shelf as a little marker over here that I got my prize back, I got my possession back. No, when God redeems you, he ultimately redeems you to return you to your original intent. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So it's like whatever the enemy stole out of your life, Whatever the enemy, the years that the enemy stole out of your life and you feel like I've come to God now and now I'm so old or now I'm 50 years old, now I'm 40 years old, now I'm 30 years old. I've missed a whole lot of God. I wish I could get all those years back. God said, you ain't got to worry about getting those years back because I know how to put you back into your original intention because you were meant for something more than addictions. You were meant for something more than depression. Question, you come on are you hearing what I'm saying you were meant for something more he told Israel you were meant for something more than just making bricks or return you to your original purpose I want to put you back to work and in your place it is so important that when God redeems us that we don't just come and sit on the pew come on y'all are y'all hearing what I'm saying it's so important that I find a way to get plugged into my church, into my community, into the people of God. How can I be a part? How can I be a part of the worship team up here? How can I be a part of the ushers? How can I be a part of the greeters? How can I help in parking the cars? How can I help in teaching the children? I have a passion for kids. How can I help? How can I get plugged in? I'm cooking good meals for Bishop Gary when he comes and all that stuff. How can I be plugged in? And how can I get connected into the house of God? What is my gift? What are my gifts that, that I feel passionate about? What are the things, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, what am I supposed to do in the kingdom? I just ask them, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? I can't tell you what you do. What do you do? What do you do that you would do whether anybody paid you or not? People say, well, how did you get your start in ministry? Because I was always there. <laughs> no, no. I was always there, and I didn't walk around and tell people I played the piano. No, I went and sat down on the piano and just started playing. And they walked up, and they were like, oh, you play the piano, don't you? And I said, a little bit. I was like 13. I was like shy and like a little bit. And the, and the music director said, I'll tell you what, come up here and sit by me in the service. 
And boy, back that day, that was a big church. We had 1,200 people, 125 voice choir, all this kind of stuff, full band. You remember, David, it was a big church back in then. And it was a great church, incredible music, wasn't it? Back in the day, it was amazing. And I would go in there, and I would be so blown away by all the music they were doing. And he would say, sit here beside me and watch. And about halfway through the service, he'd just scoot over, and he'd say, now come over here and start playing. And he would teach me how to play. But you know why he could do it? Because I was always sitting there ready. I was ready. I was waiting to go. I wasn't, they didn't have to call me. They didn't have to look for me. When the pastor started a little prayer group with the men, and I was, I was supposed to be 18 to be a part of that group, but I was only 15. I would ride with my 17-year-old brother to the meeting, and I would take my yellow tablet and my Bible, and I would go hide behind a door, and I'd pull that door to so nobody could see me back there, and I would sit back there, and I would listen to the meeting, and I'd take notes, and I'd write down the scriptures until one night my pastor walked by, and he said, what are you doing back there? And I almost started crying. I said, I've been here every night. And I opened up my little notebook, and he saw all those notes. He said, man, anybody wants it that bad, come on out here. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You don't, I didn't get started in ministry because I had a business card. I didn't get started in, in ministry because I networked with a bunch of people. I didn't get plugged in because I, I knew somebody that nobody else knew. I got plugged in because I was hungry. I wanted it. I wanted it bad. I wanted to know what it was like. And you know what? I wanted it so bad that I became the janitor. Don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. I vacuumed. I cleaned. And listen, I didn't just clean toilets. I cleaned toilets. I mean, these... <laughs> The toilets I cleaned was the kindergartner's toilets. I don't think they knew where it was. You had to put on a hazmat suit to go in that bathroom. I'm going to just tell you. <laughs> you better be careful. But are you hearing what I'm saying to you tonight? There's something about just saying, this is my house. This is my church. I belong here. It's been 15 years. You're debt free. My God, what a chance. What an opportunity for little country church to explode on the horizon. What an opportunity. I'm telling you, you got an opportunity here that I don't see a lot of places. I'm telling you, you are so primed for something good in God. You are so primed for revival. You are so primed to break out. You are set up. I don't know very many churches around the country that are out of debt. I just, I don't. I don't know very many that are out of debt. I'm just telling you, God is doing something in your house. Don't miss this opportunity. Touch your neighbor and say, God's doing something here. Come on, say it again. Say, God's doing something here. God's doing something right here. Yeah, right here. Number four. This is what he said, and I'm almost done. I'm going to close it. He said, I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. You will become the people in the city that makes the difference. If God is going to be your God and you're going to be his people, then that means I'm so connected to the one who created the universe. And I'm so connected to the creator of humanity. I'm so connected to the one who flung the stars in the heavens and they hang there by the word of his power. I'm so connected to the one that causes the sun and to rise every 24 hours on that east side of the city. I'm so connected to him that I, 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 I feel every breath. I feel every movement. I'm not out here caught up in the fray of the political scene. Come on, on y'all. I'm not out here. Oh, I love... I love watching football. I don't, I don't like it much as he do, but I'm just going <laughs> to. This brother keep 
a football game going all the time somewhere. I ain't mad at him, but I just, I just I'm, I'm not that much into football. I like to watch it when the Cowboys are winning. <laughs> but if they ain't winning, <laughs> I'm going to shut it off. <laughs> but hear what I'm saying. I don't want to be so caught up in anything that I don't know where he is and I don't know what he's saying and I don't know what he's doing. Jesus said, he said this, he said, I only do what I see my father do. I only say what I hear him say. I was telling some of the leadership that came together last night that per perfected theology is not found in college. Real perfected theology is found by studying the life of Jesus. He is perfected theology. You watch how he operated with his father. You watch how he did what his father did. You watch how he calmed the storm. We don't have any fear of calming the storm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me tell you something. You can't say peace be still if you don't have peace. <laughs> you can't be afraid and say peace be still. Peace be still. That don't, that don't work. That don't work. You got to know that you know. I was telling the saints last night, and I'm closing, but I was telling the people last night, <clears throat> we were talking about a little bit about divine healing. Because I believe that God is ready to show himself strong in the church like we've never seen him before. He is so ready, Pastor. He is so ready to show himself strong. And we're about to see miracles break out in ways we've never seen them. And you got to get ready because there are going to be people that are demonized, people that are struggling, people, not everybody, not everybody, not everybody just has a chemical imbalance. Not everybody. Some of them have a devil. Don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. Some of it is, 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 is struggles that people have opened doors to spiritual attitudes that they've allowed into their lives. And they've allowed stuff to get in and take root in their life. And some of that has to be cast out. And we don't have to be afraid. But we can't be demonized while we're casting out demons. Are y'all hear me? Come on, somebody. You got to walk in some freedom. So what I'm telling you is we got to step it up a notch. We're 15 years old. It's time to mature now. Let's take it to the next level and let's get ready because God is about to do something in our midst like we've never seen. I was telling him, this is the grandparents. Jerry and Susie Whitehead are the grandparents of the little baby I talked about. I told them about Bodie. They called me and said they wanted me to dedicate Bodie a little grandson, but Bodhi had issues, the doctor said. They said he had a tethered spine cord and that his tethered spinal cord would result in some crippling. And how old is Bodhi? He's three months old? Three months old. And, but he was going to have some uh, crippling. He was going to have possibly some retardation and everything else because it would mess with every part of his being. It would mess with every part of his little body. And we just said, well, you know, that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable. And I was telling them, because we were talking about divine healing needing to be taught and divine healing that you have to believe in divine healing. But I'm telling you, it is, it is, it is a step. It is even beyond just believing in divine healing. I believe in divine healing, and I've watched God do miracles all my life. And I, the first miracle I saw, I saw when I was about three years of age. And I saw a, the first miracle I ever saw was a dead woman raised. That was the first miracle. Boy, no. That was the first miracle I ever saw. It was because God was showing me something. God was preparing me for where I'm going. This woman in front of me fell over, died in the pew. I was three years old. I remember standing up and looking over the pew like, oh, my God, she's dead. And back then, you know, they didn't have 
uh, all this stuff to, to help people. So they, the nurse came over, couldn't find a pulse. She's touching her everywhere. She's trying, she's feeling on the wrist and all this stuff. Finally, she gets a mirror, sticks it up under her nose to see if there was a vapor, you know, of her breathing. There was no breathing, and they, they checked it for like 10 minutes. And there's no breathing for like 10 minutes. And the old preacher that was preaching was blind. Oh, check this out. <laughs> Think about it. A man who can't see in the natural, y'all, but he can see in the spirit. He said, and he talked, and he didn't wear shades, you know, back then. And that, that would freak me out as a little kid. You know, his eyes was all over the place. I'd be like, I was scared of Brother Duke. It's like, well, <clears throat> I didn't want to be around him. They would say, hey, why don't you take Brother Duke? No, no, I ain't taking that joker nowhere. I don't know where he'd be looking. <laughs> but <laughs> Brother Duke, Brother Duke standing in the pulpit and he yells out, What's going on? He's looking all over the place. And they, somebody stepped up and told him, said, there, there's a lady that's, that's died back here in the pew. He said, lead me to her. They brought him down the pulpit. He came back, and it was about right there on the third row, about where you sit. <laughs> Not that you fix and die, nothing now. I'm just telling you right now, I'm about to call you to life, okay? <laughs> and he walked up here, and he stood, and I'm standing right there. I mean, right there. And I'm looking at this woman. And I'm looking at him and his eyes roving all over the place. And he's, he, they said, she's right in front of you. And he stood there for a minute and he said, woman, get up. And that woman went <sighs> and raised up off of that pew. Don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. I saw God raise a dead woman. I've seen it twice. I've seen God raise dead people back to life twice. I prayed for a man. God spoke to me one night. I'm doing a concert. There's a man all the way in the back of the church. He's standing back there, and I can tell he's a visitor because I'm in a predominantly African-American church. He's about the only white brother back there. <clears throat> and uh, I, God spoke to me and said he was going to heal that man's back. And I said, sir, yes, sir, you right there. And boy, he turned beet red. I said, God said he's going to heal your back. Come down here. So the guy walks down there. And he walks like this. And I said, what's wrong with your back? He said, I have a steel rod in my back. I was like, Jesus, did you really say you was going? <laughs> I missed this one, didn't I? <laughs> I had no fear. I had no fear because I knew his voice. Y'all hear what I'm telling you? I knew what he said. I had no fear. I said, brother, what can you not do right now with that steel rod in your back? He said, I can only bend over like this. He said, I can't move my back any further than about that. And I said, what happened to your back? And he said, I'm a truck driver. And he said, and I sat in those seats that were not, you know, so stiff all those years before they had real good cushion and stuff. And he said, I just jarred my back together until they had to go in there and put a pipe in there or a rod in there and weld this thing to it kind of thing. And he said, and I'm just, he said, my back hurts all the time. I said, wow. Because then I knew I was right. Because <laughs> that was the only thing wrong with him. Y'all don't. And God said, I'm going to heal that man's back. And that's the only thing this guy's got wrong with him. But it's a steel rod. And I said, well, brother, I said, there's something about faith when it comes. And in the moment, I said, you have to respond to God in a way that you have never responded before. And I said, when I touch you, I want you to do something instantly that you can't do right now. He said, okay. I said, you ready? He said, yes, sir. And I said, because I feel faith in here right now. And I said, and in my mind, you ain't got no choice. You just about to be healed. I said, I don't know what he's going to do with that rod, but you're going to be healed. And he said, yes, sir. And I said, all right. 
I said, as soon as I say it, man, I mean, I want you to do it. And I said, Father, would you do for this man just what you just told me you were going to do for him? I said, in Jesus' name. And I touched that man, and that joker leaned over, dropped his hands flat on the ground, rolled his back four or five times, and just started jumping like a wild man all over the place. I saw that man for years after that, and he'd go, hey, bro, I still got that back heel. Still got that back heel. Let me tell you something. God wants to do stuff that we can't even conceive in our minds. That's why it's exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or think. God is ready to do some crazy stuff in our midst. They bring me little Bodie. I said, listen, y'all tell me, y'all find out everything the doctors are saying. Tell me what the doctors are saying, because here's what the doctors do. Doctors cannot tell you your future. But what they can do is give you the understanding and the words of how to pray with specificity. So I want to find out everything that doctor knows about the situation. Because I'm going to speak to that thing, whatever that thing is. So where's the root of it? I don't want to know what the possibilities are of happening in his life. I want to know the root of it. What's the root cause? Because that's what I want to talk to. So we got some oil. Put it in my hand. I laid a little Bodie in my hand. I didn't get all excited. I just said, Bodie, I command your spine to become untethered in the name of Jesus. Bodhi, I command you to live like a normal young man. To live the way that God has commanded your body to be and ordained your body to grow. And I command you to be healed now in the name of Jesus. And I turned around and I handed the baby to his daddy and I said, your baby's healed. That was Sunday. Thursday. Tony, the mother, takes the baby to the doctor. Before they could get out of the doctor's office, I'm getting text. Praise God. They don't know what happened, but Bodie ain't got no issues. He is totally normal. His body's complete and whole. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you, God wants to do some stuff in this house, but he wants a free people. He wants a people that are delivered, who are set free, who are ready to take the horns of the altar and hang on till miracles show up. Come on, get on your feet and bless God. Come on, come on, come on. Woo. I don't know about y'all, but salvation is powerful, but I want real freedom too. I want purpose, and I really want to make a difference. I want it to matter that I lived. Just a brief little story, 1998, 20 years ago this year, October the 9th, my son was killed in a car accident. This week, this week, this week, I saw an old friend, and uh, he, was, he had been there at the hospital when my son was taken in. And he said to me, he said, I have something on my chest I've always wanted to say. And he said, I just want to let you know. He said, I wanted to ask you about something. And I said, what's that? And he said, did anybody ever say anything to you about Brandon being shot in the face? Well, when he said that, I'd never heard that in my life. For 20 years, I'm thinking my son died in a car accident, and now you're going to tell me he died by a gunshot to his face? I instantly went right back to the moment that he died. I lost my composure. I lost my breath. I couldn't speak. I couldn't say anything. I'm just sitting there. I'm petrified. I don't even know how to handle it. Now, I had gone to Galveston to get a little R&R. &R. I had two days of the most 
powerful time in the presence of God. I stayed in my hotel room. I prayed. I read the word. I just sought the face of God. I knew I was coming here, and I wanted to have the right words to tell you and all this stuff. But I needed something for myself, and then this hits. And for two nights, I was terrorized. Two days. Not a, it was one night a day, half a day kind of thing. I was I mean, terrorized by this thing. And I finally got some calls in, found out for sure that none of that had ever happened. And I'm like, well, thank God. That was a relief. But watch this. It put me in contact with the young boy that was driving the car the night Brandon was killed. I hadn't talked to this young boy, Richard Craddock, in 20 years. Not because I intentionally didn't want to talk to him, but all of a sudden, I'm talking to this young man. And I said, Papa, what is all this about? He said, you've been crying out for freedom in your house. You've been asking me for freedom for yourself, for everybody else, people in your ministry, working with people, walking with people, teaching freedom classes, doing all this stuff. He said, if you want real freedom, go help this young man find his freedom. I'm going to tell you something. You're not ready for that while you're still in bondage. You can only go back and deal with issues like that once you have been free. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I wonder what God is setting this house up for. Pastor Jerry, I see nothing but greatness. I see nothing but greatness. How many of you know hurting people? How many of you know hurting people? How many of you know people around you who are hurting and people who are broken and messed up and suffering and dealing with all kind of stuff? See, God wants to make us free so we can go back and get them by the hand and say, come on, let me show you the way to freedom. Let me show you how to get really free. I know you repented, but let me show you how to get out of it. Are you hearing me tonight? So, Father, I yield this house to you, God. This amazing, beautiful people called the Little Country Church. My dearest of friends, Pastor Jerry Hovatt. God, I just thank you for this incredible spirit that's in this house. But Father, take us deeper. Do more in us this year, God. Lord, and let it come in quantum leaps. <laughs> Whoo, I feel that right there. Let it come in quantum leaps, God. Let it happen exponentially, quick, suddenlies, real suddenlies, God. Deliverances, God. Healings. Oh, God, delivering us from things that we thought we'd never get over. I break the spirit of depression and oppression and things that would fight against us, God. I break the spirit of abuse in here right now, God, that has held women hostage and young men hostage for years, God, over things that happened when they were little kids. God, we break that spirit right now. We break that curse. We break that lie of the enemy. And we tell him to get his hands off in the name of Jesus. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Satan, the blood of Jesus prevails in this house. Jesus, pour out your blood on all of us, God. Cover us in your blood. Redeem us with your power, God. And put us to our original purpose, God. And cause us to make a difference in this community, God, like never before. Don't let us get satisfied. Don't let us get satisfied and just sit down and say, well, we arrived. We did this and we did that and we came and we saw. But God, put a fire in this house. Put a fire in this house, God. 
put a passion to pray in this house, God. Put a spirit of intercession upon your people, God. Some of you won't even know what's happening, but God's going to wake you up in the middle of the night, and you're going to feel like you just need to get up and go sit in his presence. And I'm going to tell you, you're doing the right thing. Just get up and go sit in his presence. Go sit in your easy chair and just talk to the Lord. Don't turn on the TV. Just talk to the Lord. Just talk to him like you would talk to a friend. He is your friend. Talk to him. And a spirit of intercession be birthed in this house, God, for the kingdom of God in Crosby, Texas, God. God, let the fires of revival run up and down these streets, God. Let miracles break out in here, God. Let the passion and the zeal of the praise and worship cause you to sit down upon us, God, in all of your glory and all of your power. And God, let the glory of God be seen and felt in this land. Father, we thank you for it. We lift up our pastor, God. We lift up the leadership of this house. We lift up, God, those around us. God, we pray encouragement upon them. 15 years is no joke. 15 years is no joke. So, God, we pray encouragement upon them. We pray your blessing upon them. And we pray, God, that the fire of God get upon all of us. Father, we thank you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we thank you right now and we bless your name. We glorify you and we honor you in this place. God, be magnified among your people. Be glorified among your people, God. Let the praises of God go up and let the glory of God come down. And Father, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Now, somebody get radical in your praise for just a moment. Come on, get radical. Get radical. Get radical in your praise. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, get radical in that praise just for a moment. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, God. Glory to your name, God. We bless you and we glorify you. Come on, come on. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, here's what uh, we're going to close this way. First, I need everybody to get shoulder to shoulder with somebody. Make sure you ain't by yourself. That, that includes you, Roy D. Amen. Scoot in there until you find somebody's shoulder. Amen. Just kind of get shoulder. I just want to make sure there's somebody there. Now, 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 this church knows me. You've heard me say this before. When Jesus took the boy's sack lunch, he grabbed out fish and bread and he snapped the head and the head grew a tail, tail and the tail grew a head. head and he snapped it again the head grew a tail and the tail grew a head right and then he gave it to the disciples and there's 5,000 men plus women and children that means 15,000 people are there probably minimal and then the disciples started walking among the people who were set in companies of 50 and 100 and they snapped a fish and the head grew a, and the tail grew a and then he gave it to this guy, and he snapped it, and the head grew a, and the tail grew a head. And then one guy grabbed some bread, and he snapped it, and he had a wheat field in one hand, an ocean in the other. And they began to move it throughout the people. So everybody was involved in the miracle, right? It was Jesus just prayed over it one time, and then everybody else got blessed, all right? So this is what we're going to do tonight. Everybody in here, because I know you, got something wrong with you. The only one in here that don't is David Huff. <laughs> but everybody else in here, and the only reason he don't is because he drinks triple espressos every morning. I found that's the secret to longevity. All right? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray for each other tonight, as the Scripture tells us to. And without asking them, because of the, 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 there's faith in this room right now. There's, there's excitement in here. There's something going on in here. I agree with him. He, this ain't just hype talk. There's something happening in our church. I sense it. So we're going to pray for each other. And you don't have to get too spiritual here. Or get too, All you're going to do is put your hand upon his shoulder and just pray with me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus heal, heal, prosper, prosper give, favor. give favor. I thank you, I thank for, you. My for my friend, my family member. I speak into their life. 
that in the name of Jesus, as they go forth, they be healed. We stand on it. We believe it in Jesus' name. Now, Father, bless the food that's going to be out there as we go to it. We thank you for an opportunity to fellowship tonight because fellowship is a part of what family and tribes do together. So, God, bless the fellowship. Bless it. Make it rich in Jesus' name. And everybody say Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask real fast in the back. Guys, real quick instructions. We're going to go down to Hall Ken or outside? Okay. So, uh, Mike. I need you to stand at them double doors and push everybody down the hall.